I'm just reviewing the agenda you have set up here, which is very helpful. And then I'll indicate that it's, uh, you know, we'll now have time for some questions and then they'll sort of switch to you to ask questions and so forth. So thank you everyone for coming today for this um, for joining us this afternoon. We have some special guests and before we get there, I would just like to welcome you on behalf of the Boston Public Library. I'm Kristen Motti, one of the adult programs librarians. Um, welcome to Never Too Late. This is our weekly two o'clock program on Thursdays and we have a really interesting talk today. Um, a little bit different than what we usually have. I hope that you enjoy it and if you were here last night, Welcome back. Just before joining us, I want to give you a little bit of, uh, we want to cover a little bit of housekeeping. If you're in Zoom, you're on mute, um, and there's a Q&A button on your screen. If you have a question, and I see that some people have already typed questions in there, go ahead and put your questions in there at any time during the talk. If you're watching on YouTube, the chat box should be open, and you can go ahead and put your questions there, and someone will be moder monitoring those. Um, this is being live streamed to YouTube and recorded. So it will be available afterwards. The program will last until about three o'clock and there will be a talk, a conversation, and then also an opportunity to answer those questions that you are asking our speaker. Now, please join me in welcoming Ginevra Morse, our co-host from the New England Historic Genealogical Society, American Ancestors. Ginevra is the head of education and online programs at NEHGS. Welcome, Ginevra. Thank you, Kristen. I'm honored to be here and to welcome NEHGS members and friends to this program. We're excited to be partnering with the Boston Public Library once again. And as Kristen mentioned, my name is Ginevra Morse. I'm the Director of Education and Online Programs at American Ancestors and New England Historic Genealogical Society. American Ancestors is the oldest and largest nonprofit genealogical society of its kind in the world. We were founded in 18. 45 and help people of all backgrounds explore their past and understand their family's unique place in history. You can learn more about our resources, experts, education programs, and our eight-story research center in Boston at our award-winning website, AmericanAncestors.org. Now, as one of the publishers of this 400th anniversary edition of William Bradford's seminal work of Plymouth Plantation, we're very excited to hear from two of its editors today, Dr. Ken Minkema and Dr. Frank Bremer. Uh, this a new edition offers a new transcription of the original manuscript with annotations that incorporate recently discovered information. And it also includes a very special introduction by Wampanoag historian Paula Peters. And to learn more about this story of the Pilgrims, the Wampanoag, and the Mayflower, and to purchase a copy of this newly published edition, I encourage you to visit mayflower.americanancestors.org. So it's now my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today's event, Dr. Kenneth Minkema, executive editor of the works of Jonathan Edwards and of the Jonathan Edwards Center and online archive at Yale University. Dr. Minkema is also a member of the research faculty at Yale Divinity School and a research associate at the University of the Free State, South Africa. He offers seminars in early American and early modern religious history, as well as reading courses in all periods of American religious history. He has contributed several articles to the Journal of American History, the William and Mary Quarterly, the New England Quarterly, and the Massachusetts Historical Review, among others. He has also edited or co-edited several works, too many to name here, uh, on the sermons of Jonathan Edwards and other colonial preachers. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Minkema. Thank you very much, uh, Ginevra. Um, and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Frank uh, Bremer, um, who I've known for quite some time. I think I first met you, Frank, back when you did one of your wonderful conferences at Millersville back in 1991. If you can remember that far away, I was a young graduate student and these conferences offered the opportunity for up and coming people like myself to rub shoulders with 
you know, the giants on the earth like yourself and, and others and to get the proper introduction to uh, the field of Puritan studies. I, I remember one session in particular where we tried to define Puritanism. And while we came up with various things in the end, we just couldn't do it. But we decided that when we, we, we knew a Puritan when we saw one. <laughs> and that was about as close as we could get. Um, the Puritans considered it the height of bad manners to praise someone to their face. But um, where Frank Bremer is concerned, I can't help but, but do that because he's really and sincerely one of this country's and indeed one of the world's most distinguished historians of Puritanism and of early American religious history. Uh, he has a lengthy list of service, not just of publications, but of service, which is really important other part of a, a scholar's life, given to teaching and mentoring and organizing those conferences that I mentioned and other service on various boards and committees. Um, so he's really been a real shaper of the, of the field. He's published many books and articles on a wide range of topics, textbooks, monographs, biographies, including one of John Winthrop, on whose uh, paper, whose papers he edits at the Mass Historical Society. Um, he's a moving force behind New England beginnings, which we'll hear a little bit about in the course of his presentation. Um, and of course, uh, with the uh, new, newly uh, upcoming uh, observations on the uh, 400th anniversary of the founding of Massachusetts uh, colonies, colonized towns, uh, it, it seemed appropriate to begin with, with Plymouth and with this new edition of Bradford's of Plymouth Plantation, which Frank and I and others that you heard mentioned uh, teamed up and, and did this uh, very enjoyable and, and I hope significant and, and helpful project. Along with that, Frank's authored a new book, A One Small Candle, The Story of Plymouth Puritans and the Beginning of New England, of English, New England. So I hope you all check that out when it comes out in a few months. And drawing on these projects, uh, Professor Bremer will talk to us today on William Bradford and Plymouth, The View from 400 Years. So Frank, Please. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Ken, and everyone who was out there and joining us for this. Uh, I hope we have enough time to answer all of your questions at the end, but if there are some of your questions that don't get answered, uh, please uh, feel free to uh, email me, uh, francis.bremer at Millersville University. Uh, at millersville.edu, I should say. Um, in the fall of 2016, a group of individuals representing historical organizations in the Commonwealth and other New England states met in the reading room of the Congregational Library to form a partnership called New England Beginnings. This was a group coming together to make plans for the 400th anniversary of the settlement of Plymouth. The goal was to educate Americans about the cultures, plural, that shaped early New England. We were and are determined to find ways to commemorate those cultures, European, Native, African, rather than to follow tradition and merely celebrate one culture, that of the Pilgrim Fathers. The focus on education proved to have had unanticipated benefits, while more celebratory events that look for large gatherings of tourists have proved impossible in this time of pandemic, many educational programs have been able to be held. The publication of books has continued on pace, and lectures such as this one, and even conferences, have gone online. Our determination to focus on multiple cultures was the result of a shift in historical understanding that was given impetus at the time of the 350th anniversary of the settlement of Plymouth. In preparation for that event, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and descendants of the Mayflower passengers 
decided to invite a member of the Wampanoag tribe, the people who had assisted the pilgrims through their early struggles to address the crowd that would gather for the event. The invitation was extended to Frank James, a member of the Aquana Wampanoag tribe who at the age of 14 had taken the native name Wamsutta. James had served in the United States Coast Guard Auxiliary in World War II. He was a musician, a brilliant trumpet player, who was the first native graduate of the New England Conservatory of Music and a music teacher on Cape Cod. He was considered, presumably, a safe choice to speak at the celebrations. But when the organizing committee reviewed the text of his address, they insisted on changes, which he rightly declined to make. The invitation was withdrawn. Instead, on Thanksgiving Day in 1970, James addressed a separate gathering of fellow natives and others on Coles Hill, overlooking Plymouth Harbor and a replica of the Mayflower. In the text he had prepared for a very different audience, James admitted, as he put it, that it is with mixed emotion that I stand here to share my thoughts. This is a time of celebration for you, celebrating an anniversary of a beginning for the white man in America, a time of looking back or reflection. It is with a heavy heart that I look back at what happened to my people. Even before the pilgrims landed, he continued, it was common practice for explorers to capture Indians, take them to Europe, and sell them as slaves for 220 shillings apiece. The pilgrims had hardly explored the shores of Cape Cod for four days before they robbed the graves of my ancestors and stolen their corn and beans. Wamsutter went on to enumerate various atrocities and broken promises and ended by saying, you the white man, are celebrating an anniversary. We, the Wampanoags, will help you celebrate in the concept of a beginning. It was at the beginning of a new life for the pilgrims. Now, 350 years later, it is a beginning of a new determination for the original American, the American Indian. Now, Frank Wamsutta James was not the first native New Englander to remind the public of the long history and continued presence of the native population of the region. In 1838, not too far from the Boston Public Library, where this event was originally scheduled for, at the Odeon Theater on Federal Street, the Methodist preacher and Pequot Indian William Apps delivered a eulogy on King Philip in which he reversed the traditional pilgrim story to transform the Wampanoags into heroes and the English into villains. But Wamsutta's address on Coles Hill had a greater significance because it became the first of an annual event called the Day of Mourning, which has evolved over the years in its demands and tactics, but which at its heart remains an assertion of the importance of the first people of the region that the natives called Dawnland. The truths that the state's 1970 organizing committee found too uncomfortable remain to this day important truths to be addressed by all who were interested in the shaping of 17th century New England. And that was something that the organizers of New England beginnings bore in mind as we looked about what we were to do about the commemoration of 1620. Early in the process of thinking about the events of that year, the Colonial Society of Massachusetts and the New England Historic and Genealogical Society agreed to sponsor a new edition of Plymouth Governor William Bradford's of Plymouth Plantation, the most significant contemporary account of the Pilgrim's progress from Leiden, England to Plymouth, Massachusetts. The editorial team included Ken Menkema of Yale, Paula Peters of the Wampanoag Nation, and myself, the three of us here pictured, along with Jeremy Bangs of the American Pilgrim Museum in Leiden. Because the Bradford manuscript, 
included a list of Hebrew vocabulary inscribed as part of the governor's efforts to teach himself that biblical language, we engaged Yale's Eric Raymond to transcribe and introduce that material. The inclusion of an essay by a member of the Wampanoag Nation is the most striking departure of this edition from previous ones, but not the only departure. I'd like to discuss some of the things that make this volume unique and then move on to talk about how working on it has helped me to revise my understanding of Bradford and his writings. William Bradford began to compile his history in 1630, 10 years after his arrival on the Mayflower and in the same year that John Winthrop arrived in Massachusetts to, check, to take charge of the colony that would become the dominant Puritan presence in New England. While Bradford composed the work in a way that suggested he was preparing it for publication, it was not published in his lifetime. Passed on in manuscript through successive generations of his family, it was used by various individuals to tell the story of Plymouth. His nephew, Nathaniel Morton, used it in writing his own history, New England's Memorial, published in 1669. Later in the century, Puritans increased Mather, William Hubbard, and Cotton Mather drew on it for their own accounts of the region's history. In the 18th century, Thomas Prince consulted the manuscript for his Chronological History of New England, published in 1738. Prince retained the manuscript and housed it with other volumes in his collection of books and manuscripts, which was placed in the tower of the Third Church of Boston, popularly known as Old South. It was there when it was found by British troops garrisoning Boston in the American Revolution, one of whom presumably brought it to England where it ended up in the library of the Bishop of London. Having been discovered there in the mid 19th century, the manuscript was eventually, after four decades of negotiations, brought back to New England in 1897. The first publication of the work was in the collections of the Massachusetts Historical Society in 1856, while the manuscript was still in England. A Commonwealth edition was published in 1898, following the repatriation of the volume. And since then, there have been a number of other editions. When our edition came out in May, someone asked on Facebook why she should buy it, because she already had five other editions. Well, let me try and answer that. This is, both in its printed form and in the soon to appear online version, the most accurate transcription of the manuscript that is available. A high resolution color scan of the original enabled Ken Minkema to detect additions and emendations made by Bradford at various points of its composition and to establish that some of the insertions and marks on the pages were made by a later user, most likely Thomas Prince. As Dr. Minkema has pointed out in his introductory essay, we can judge with some degree of certainty that Bradford made at least two passes and likely more through the text, stretching into the 1650s. He did not abandon his history, as some had said, but continued to try and clarify his meaning and improve his style. Early on, we decided to include into the text itself letters which Bradford had inserted into his narrative, but which previous editors had relegated to appendices. Similarly, while Bradford wrote on the right side pages of the manuscript book, he placed some later editions on the blank facing pages, such as this one. We also incorporated these into the main text as Bradford intended. The result of these decisions was to produce the material as the author had planned. Another feature of the new edition is how we've approached the annotation. The last major edition to have significant annotation was that produced by Samuel Elliott Morrison in 1952. Our understanding of Puritan religion, the pilgrim experience in Leiden, Plymouth Colony, society and economics, and native history have substantially changed in the decades since. And there have been substantial advances 
in chronicling the lives of the first colonists. We wish to incorporate these new insights into this edition, including putting a greater sensitivity to the native perspective in the notes, as well as in Paula Peter's introductory essay. Robert Charles Anderson was particularly helpful in dealing with the details of pilgrim lives, while Jeremy D. Bangs brought to bear his expertise on all aspects of the story. While the most notable account of the story of the Plymouth colony, Bradford's history is not the only source. Edward Winslow, one of the leaders of the colony who would serve for a time as governor and then as an agent of the colonies to the English government is generally considered the principal author of the journal of the beginnings and proceedings of the English plantation settled at Plymouth, published in 1622 and generally known as Mort's Relation. Winslow also published a number of other works dealing with the colony's early history, including Good News from New England, Hypocrisy Unmasked, and New England Salamander. Thomas Morton and other enemies of the colony published their own accounts of the Pilgrim Adventure, accounts that were much more critical. Some early sympathetic historians, including Nathaniel Morton and William Hubbard, had the advantage of speaking to men and women who had themselves played a part in the colony story and incorporated those tales into their own narratives. Drawing on all of these, we made an effort to include in our annotation material that sometimes supplemented, but occasionally contradicted Bradford's narrative. Equally significant, our notes draw on Bradford's other writings. During the last decade of his life, he composed three dialogues, as they are known, accounts of the religious dimensions of the story organized as exchanges between the ancients of the colony and members of the younger generation. Two of the three survive. They were, in many ways, unfiltered. And in them, he dealt far more with the religion of the pilgrims than he did in his history. Bradford, also composed poems, something relatively common among educated men at the time. Dealing primarily with history and religion, the poems were a venue in which he also expressed feelings that he tempered in his history. Finally, he compiled a letter book in which he copied correspondence that told the colony story and which he drew on when he wished to insert into his text letters he considered important. Only a portion of that manuscript survives, but it indicates the scope of the original. The first extant page contains a letter from the colony's investors written in 1624. That page is numbered 339, suggesting a vast number of items from early years that we would love to know about. But in drawing on the letter book, Bradford sometimes omitted portions of the letters he was including in his history. Where those omissions are significant, we have printed them in the annotations. As all this might suggest, the task of producing this 400th anniversary of Plymouth Plantation was much more complex than I had originally imagined. And in working on it, I learned much more about William Bradford and his colony than I had previously known. That is what I wish to reflect upon in the time remaining. In historical writing in general, including the history of early New England that I focus on, it is important to guard against accepting orthodoxies without question, drawing distinctions at the expense of ignoring commonalities, and achieving clarity at the expense of neglecting nuances. Over the past decade, I've revisited a variety of subjects I've previously dealt with and ask myself if I have been guilty of any of these errors. I found that I had succumbed to the fallacy of presenting New England as Boston writ large, overlooking the significant differences between the colonies and within each of them. I didn't always spend enough time examining the differences between the various representatives of so-called orthodox Puritanism, such as the differences between leaders such as John Winthrop and Thomas Dudley, 
I accepted without question the idea that membership in colonial churches required a conversion narrative, rather than recognizing that the primary value of those relations was an evangelical tool to help others. Recently, as I suggested in my Baxter lecture last evening, I've been questioning the assumption that the only stories of Puritan women worth telling were those of dissonance, like Anne Hutchinson and Mary Dyer. It was with this background of questioning standard interpretations that I began work on the Bradford edition and simultaneously on a study of the religion of the Puritans that is due to be published by Oxford University Press in a few months. One of the things the evidence led me to question was the term pilgrims, as it was intended to distinguish the Plymouth settlers from Puritans. There were two elements to this. One centered on the way the Plymouth story was told by the generations after the revolution who sought to identify the essence of the new nation. For the most part, these early national historians and politicians lumped the pilgrims with the Puritan settlers of New England and extolled them all as founders of American democracy and exemplars of the search for religious toleration. Pilgrim accomplishments were enumerated in speeches at Plymouth by national leaders such as John Quincy Adams and Daniel Webster. The descendants of the Mayflower held annual parades and dinners to celebrate their forefathers. But by the early 20th century, the story was being revised. Those who felt constrained by the moral codes of the Victorian age blamed the Puritans and in the process mischaracterized them in many ways. This attack on the Puritans is perhaps best encapsulated in the writings of the 20th century commentator H.L. Mencken, who quipped that Puritanism is the haunting fear that someone, somewhere, may be happy. Literary scholars such as Vernon Parenkin and Van Wyck Brooks argued that Puritanism suppressed creative intellectual growth. Scholars who saw economic drives as the essence of history argued that the search for wealth was the driving force behind the settlement and growth of New England. Popular culture came to misunderstand Puritans as theocratic, misogynistic, repressive prudes with bad fashion sense who executed those who disagreed with them and burned witches. In essence, historical fashion went from praise that ignored the blemishes that were part of Puritanism to concentrating only on those blemishes. For those closely connected to the Plymouth story, it became desirable, even imperative, to distinguish the pilgrims from the Puritans. And there was some evidence that seemed to point in this direction or at least support it. During the late 16th and early 17th centuries, English church authorities had attacked Puritans who were struggling to reform the church from within by saying that their views inevitably led to separation and thus destroyed the unity of the church. In order to retain their credibility as reformers rather than revolutionaries, most Puritans had denied any connection with separatists, such as the ancient church in Amsterdam and John Robinson's congregation in Leiden. Scholars who bought into this position ignored the many things that most Puritans had in common with, this, common with the separatists and emphasized the one issue which did divide them. Focusing on the debate between separatists and other Puritans on whether it was necessary to leave the Church of England, one could easily find evidence that the two groups were hostile to each other. Further evidence of distancing could be found in the religious debates that accompanied English civil, the English civil wars or Puritan revolution of the 1640s and 1650s. Advocates of Presbyterianism such as the Scot Robert Bailey sought to discredit English Congregationalists as offshoots of separatism by way of New England. To free themselves from being tarred as separatist, colonial authors such as John Cotton vigorously denied that their church polity was derived from the pilgrims 
or any other separatist influence. Many historians bought this argument with a number of influential scholars denying the significance of the Pilgrim colony in the shaping of New England religion. Perry Miller, who did much to legitimize the study of New England Puritanism, argued that the churches of Massachusetts would have been no different if Plymouth had never existed. Sack Van Berkowitz similarly dismissed the Pilgrims as an insignificant group with no grand design that contributed to shaping American history. And Theodore Dwight Bozeman went further, arguing that Plymouth was pathetically unimportant. I would suggest that such scholars were misled by Cotton and other contemporaries who protested too much. Recently, some historians have been willing to reopen the question of Plymouth's influence on the Bay Colony. I examined the subject in considerable depth in my forthcoming book, but this afternoon, I only want to highlight a few pieces of evidence. First are the clear statements provided by John Endicott and Charles Scott at the time. When the first settlers sent by the Massachusetts Bay Company arrived in Salem in 1628, they were racked by disease, much as the pilgrims had been in their first winter. Their governor, John Endicott, requested help from Plymouth, and Governor Bradford sent Samuel Fuller, the colony's physician, but also a deacon of the Plymouth congregation. This was the first of a number of trips taken by Fuller over the next few years to the Bay Colony. Fuller's ability to impact the disease was likely minimal, but he spent many hours in consultation with the Puritan leaders of Salem who had no clergymen at the time. And then on later visits, he engaged in similar discussion with John Winthrop and other lay leaders of the 1630 migration. The question before all who emigrated in the early years of Massachusetts was how to form churches and undertake worship. The answer was to be found in the practices of those who had formed congregations themselves, such as that at Scrooby, forming it through lay initiative. In letters to Governor Bradford, inserted into Bradford's letter book and then copied into a Plymouth plantation, Endicott praised Fuller for his knowledge of Mr. Robinson's church and expressed his view that he, John Endicott, believed the Plymouth faithful were servants of one master and of the same household, and that God's people are all marked with one and the same mark and sealed with one and the same seal and have for the main one and the same heart guided by one in the same spirit of truth. And where this is, there can be no discord. Nay, there must be sweet harmony. Also significant are letters in Bradford's letter book from Charles Gott, one of those who had arrived in Salem with Endicott. Gott not only engaged in discussions with Fuller, but traveled himself to Plymouth, where he was entertained by Bradford and by William Brewster, the lay elder of the Pure Pilgrim congregation. By 1629, following Plymouth's example of lay initiative, Endicott, Gott, and other Salem laymen formed a congregation, subscribed to a church covenant, and then chose as pastor and teacher two recently arrived English Puritan clergymen. A delegation from Plymouth traveled to Salem to extend to the new church, the right hand of fellowship. A similar process involving discussions with Fuller and lay leaders in the Bay preceded the formation of congregations in Boston, Watertown, and Dorchester in 1630. And most interesting, one of the new arrivals in Massachusetts, William Coddington, who had been a member of John Cotton's Boston Lincolnshire Church, told Fuller that prior to the sailing of the Winthrop fleet, it was, quote, Mr. Cotton's charge that they should take advice from them at Plymouth and should do nothing to offend them. The essence of this story 
including the text of letters, is found in what Bradford recorded in a Plymouth plantation, with some additional detail in the letter book. But that is not all. In various poems and in his dialogues, Bradford repeatedly emphasizes Plymouth's identification with the broader congregational movement as found elsewhere in New England and among the English congregational independents. In a lengthy insertion in a Plymouth plantation, he rejoices in the downfall of the bishops with their courts, canons, and ceremonies that came about with the onset of the Puritan Revolution. Clearly, a case can be made for the role of Plymouth in shaping New England's congregational Puritanism. The other major way in which my understanding of early New England has changed by immersing myself in Bradford and other sources is an understanding of the pilgrim relations with the native population. As Paula Peters makes clear in her essay in the new edition, the natives of Southern New England had ample reasons to be suspicious of the arrivals on the Mayflower. Earlier voyages of Europeans had brought diseases for which the indigenous people had no defense. As we witness the hard effects of the pandemic, pandemic sweeping the world today, we can perhaps better understand the horror of an unknown disease cutting down thousands of victims with the normal human instincts to comfort the sick and care for the dying, becoming means of spreading the contagion. In the region around Cape Cod where the pilgrims would settle, mortality rates of 50% were common and some communities suffered losses of over 90%. In the village of Patuxet, the site of which became Plymouth, there were so few survivors that those natives who remained dispersed to live in other communities. What had been a flourishing community when visited earlier in the century by the French, French explorer Champlain, depicted here, was deserted in 1620. In addition to the ravages of disease, the natives suffered from the aggressive intentions of some traders who kept, kidnapped individuals and brought them to Europe. The most famous of these was Tisquantum, better known as Squanto, who was seized at Patuxet, brought to Spain to be sold as a slave, escaped that fate, and spent time in London till he was able to make his way back to New England and his devastated homeland. Given this history, it's not surprising that as parties from the Mayflower explored the lands along Cape Cod Bay, the natives, with the exception of a brief clash at what is known as First Encounter Beach, observed them, but made no attempt to make contact. In the course of these explorations, the English found deserted villages. They desecrated graves and they seized for their own use corn stored by the Indians for their own spring planting. There are two accounts of these explorations, that related by Bradford in a Plymouth plantation and that of Edward Winslow in Mort's relation. For the first time in these, we see what I believe was a significant difference in the outlook of the two men. Bradford described the events with little detail and with little evident interest in native society. Winslow showed much more curiosity about what the expedition came across. Bradford mentioned abandoned villages and graves and taking the corn. Winslow is much more descriptive, recording the nature of the houses remaining. He reports that on their first encounter with what they assumed to be graves, they left them untouched because we thought it would be odious unto them to ransack their sepulchers. Though in the next site they came upon, he acknowledges that did not stop them from examining a grave site, the details of which Winslow recorded. Winslow recorded a story from one of the expeditions that Bradford did not. He wrote of, as we wandered, we came to a tree where a young sapling was bowed, that was bowed down over a bow and some acorns strewn, on, strewn underneath. Stephen Hopkins said it had been to catch some deer. So as we were looking at it, William Bradford, as he went about, it gave a sudden jerk up and he was immediately caught by the leg and hoisted into the air. 
Winslow went on to admire the snare. Pretty device, made with a rope of their own making and having a noose as artfully made as any roper in England can make. Bradford did not mention the episode at all, and it probably did nothing to improve his view of the natives. It's important to remind ourselves that not all of the colonists held to the same beliefs and principles. While sharing many European attitudes, Winslow always seemed interested in the native inhabitants and developed a close relationship with the Wampanoag Massasoit Usamequan. Bradford's views of the natives was far more critical. In the early chapters of his history, he wrote of them as savage barbarians, ready to fill there the pilgrim's side full of arrows. He described the landscape as they first encountered it, as a hideous and desolate wilderness, full of wild beasts and wild men. But his harshest views were confined to his poetry. In one poem, castigating the natives as a people without God or law and marveling that the colonists have lived so long among these folk, so brutish and savage without tasting of their injurious rage. Winslow, on the other hand, showed an appreciation of how Wampanoags preserved memories of important events, making a hole in the ground that would prompt questions and thus the telling of a tale, of, of a tale related to the event commemorated. And while he acknowledged that at one point he believed that the Indians about us are a people without religion or knowledge of any God, he later acknowledged that therein I erred, for they conceive of many divine powers. While we shouldn't make too much of the different views of these Plymouth leaders, there are two incidents where it seems to have made a difference in how they presented the Plymouth story. When Usamequan, the Wampanoag Massasoit, entered into a mutual assistance treaty with the pilgrims, both Bradford and Winslow saw it as a significant event, but their accounts differed. Winslow's account, the more complete, records the sixth point of the agreement as this, number six, that when their men came to us, they should leave their bows and arrows behind them as we should do with our pieces when we came to them which makes the treaty seem less one-sided than Bradford's account, which eliminates the necessity for the pilgrims to leave their weapons behind when they entered native villages. In addition to this difference, there's another significant one, which many of you are probably familiar with, and that is the discrepancy in the accounts of Bradford and Winslow of what we come to call the first Thanksgiving. Bradford simply talks about the gathering in of the harvest. He does not mention anything about the native presence. It is Winslow who gives the fuller account. Our harvest being gotten in, our governor sent four men on fowling so that we might after a special manner rejoice together after we had gathered the fruit of our labors. Many of the Indians coming amongst us and among the rest their great King Massasoit with some 90 men for whom for three days we entertained and feasted. And they went out and killed five deer which they brought to the plantation. The implication of a special event and the fact of the native presence are in this account but not in Bradford's. The questions surrounding both these cases prompted me to think more closely about the native role in the colony and the overall colonial response to that native presence. But these are not the only questions that bear consideration in the early history of Plymouth. And the editors of the new edition hope that our volume will help other scholars to investigate other questions. And that's all for now, and we can have time for some questions. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Frank. And um, I can try to relay these questions to you as they come in. I encourage folks to use the uh, Q&A uh, option there uh, uh, in Zoom. Um, we have a question from Robert. 
says, I'm wondering about Bradford's education. He quotes Seneca at one point and another place Bradford uh, writes, being thus past the vast ocean in a sea of troubles. Um, this is of course similar to Shakespeare who has Hamlet ask whether tis nobler to take arms against a sea of troubles. Um, is there any possibility, Robert asks, that Bradford knew of Shakespeare, or was this just a common metaphor at the time? I think it's very likely that he knew of the works of Shakespeare. Um, Bradford is an interesting person because he did not have uh, any education beyond the home and presumably uh, a local grammar school. Uh, he is not one of the Puritans, for instance, who went to either Oxford or Cambridge universities, but he was always very interested uh, in what we would call self-education. And he read extensively. Uh, we can tell from the inventory at his death, he had a very large collection of books. And then of course, as Robert mentioned, there are frequent mentions in his writings uh, that indicate a familiarity with a, a great number of, uh, of works. Uh, I would suggest uh, two things that if Robert is interested in this, he might do. Uh, David Lufer, L-U-P-H-E-R, uh, has written a recent book on classical influences or evidences in the records of Plymouth. And he actually talks about the passage from Seneca specifically, uh, as well as some other uh, indications of a knowledge among the pilgrims of, of classical literature. He also, uh, another book would be Jeremy D. Bangs, who's one of our co-editors, uh, recently published an inventory of all of the private libraries of people who died in Plymouth uh, in the 17th century and who left evidence of book ownership in their libraries. Uh, and the large number of, of volumes um, is impressive. In fact, I, I don't want to go on too long here, but one of the things that always struck me is that we don't recognize enough uh, the, the, the sort of intellectual baggage as Jeremy is referred to in another piece of, of the pilgrims. And, and even when we go to Plymouth Plantation, which is a marvelous recreation in which they, they give you a sense of the dress, the livestock, the building materials, but nowhere do you have any sense of the libraries. Uh, William Brewster at his death owned over 400 volumes. I have no idea where he put them. Uh, in, in, a, in a house of that size. But the fact is that there's no evidence of other than a few books here, a few books there. These are people uh, who did have very extensive libraries, quite a few of them, certainly Brewster and Bradford and Miles Standish and uh, some of the clergymen later, Ralph Partridge and so forth. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a question from uh, Stephen who asks, uh, why is it that only Bradford's history remains when the other person, I guess he's referring to Winslow, has more detailed accounts of their experiences. I suppose it would help to uh, clarify that and, and say how Winslow's accounts are, are available. Right, Winslow, uh, and, and feel free to add anything to this, Ken, but Winslow's uh, published uh, his first accounts in 1622, 1624. They're more detailed because they're dealing with a far more compressed period of time. Uh, some of his later works, like um, his attack on Samuel Gorton and such, are addressing specific issues. So Winslow never set out to write an entire history of the experience of the pilgrims. He was writing about certain events, and as a result, he could go into a great deal more detail, whereas Bradford was trying to give us the much broader picture. Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, going back to the issue, to the Shakespeare point, uh, Barbara has an interesting point relayed by Jeremy. Uh, Shakespeare was actually believed to have performed near the church that Bradford attended in Leiden. Uh, does that mean Shakespeare himself or his plays were performed? That would be clarified. But 
uh, Dr. Bang, she said, shared that with me. He thinks they may have actually seen each other. That seems to imply that perhaps Shakespeare was in Leiden at one point. I didn't know that. So I, I, I didn't know it either. And I'm going to have to talk to Dr. Bangs about that and, and find out. But uh, that's a it. remarkable thing to think about. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think in general, and I found with the Puritans, uh, there, there is some familiarity with Shakespeare's works. Uh, and while there is uh, an opposition by most, if not all Puritans, to plays, to the performance and various aspects, they didn't have any problem with the plays as literature. And yeah. so they, they, they did own copies and they could read them. But I had never heard that Shakespeare traveled abroad to yeah. Leiden. So I, I can't say anything more on that. Yeah, yeah. And we know, for instance, that, you know, Harvard College had Shakespeare's folios in its library. So for all that they denounced plays and the uh, licentiousness of that could go around the performance of plays and the right. attending of plays, as you say, they were very much in favor of, of the reading of plays. I mean, you know, Cicero and Cato and so Ed forth. Lewis and all and the, cla the classic playwrights, Aristophanes, sure. you know, they were all in the libraries. Right. Oh, yeah, that's, that wasn't an issue. Uh, Thomas asks, what's your take on Stephen Hopkins, a non-separatist, in shaping relations with the indigenous people in trade and in colonial government as a member of the council? Um, first, I, I would qualify. It's, you don't really have a council in Plymouth as in the same sense that you do in Massachusetts. You have a governor and then you have assistants that are named to, to help him. Uh, Hopkins is an interesting story. In fact, I, there's a new book that was just written on Hopkins that I have sitting on my table upstairs that I uh, have looked at the cover as Stephen Hopkins, the man who escaped Jamestown and saved Plymouth or something like that. Um, I, I'm, he's an interesting character because he was on the sea venture on its expedition to Virginia and uh, almost got executed there. And it, it's, it's assumed by many that he might've been one of the ones who, uh, told the fellow, his fellow passengers on the Mayflower that, you know, uh, being in a society, being in a place with no clear authorization or legal authority can lead to problems. Uh, and therefore, you know, we should do something thus contributing to the Mayflower Compact. But, um, but yeah, I mean, he does, he does play an important role uh, in the history of the colony. Thank you. Um, another, uh, let's see, we have a, a question from Kyle. Can you both speak a bit about the condition of the original manuscript and what it was like working with it and how much you could actually work with the original? I'm very interested in the process of creating this new uh, edition. You want to start and I'll... I, I'll let you take that entirely, Ken, because you yeah. have more physical contact with the exact actual manuscript. Yeah, so it's, very, say that it's in the state library. Yeah, it's in the mention. library of Massachusetts. They're uh, right by the green. And so uh, it's one of their prized possessions. They, they recently had it completely preserved. Uh, I think it was back in 2014. And as a part of that process, they had the manuscript um, scanned in a wonderful you know, color, high res um, production that's available online. Um, and then they also have a supplemental um, version that's available at the library itself. And so we were able to use those uh, previously unavailable um, uh, the technologies uh, to uh, create a transcription of this. And then we were also allowed uh, limited, quite limited, understandably limited um, access to the original uh, in order to look at uh, passages that were particularly difficult, like where someone later on had gone through and done a whole lot of very heavy ob ob obliterating 
Um, mm -hmm. I sure wish I could get at those texts because I'll bet there's something juicy underneath those, <laughs> uh, under those um, uh, very heavy deletions. But uh, but it just it's very difficult. It's very difficult to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so. Uh, Working with the manuscript was very much kind of an online experience supplemented by these on-site uh, visits. But I think for us as people who are interested in presenting and using primary sources from this period, this was um, a real thrill, first of all, uh, kids in candy shops, that kind of thing, even right. though we're you know, uh, older individuals. Um, but it was just a lot of fun in that sense, but also um, realizing you're part of a long history of the presentation and interpretation of this document. And so there's the consciousness that you, know, you want to do the proper presentation of it, given the uh, history of it, the, some of the controversial pieces of it and, and so forth. So. Yeah, I, I, I'd add, I just add two quick things. One is uh, we were both enormously happy that whoever taught Governor Bradford how to write paid proper attention to his penmanship. As editor of the Winthrop Papers, I have had to decipher John Winthrop's handwriting, and it is a beast. William Bradford has a very legible handwriting. It's very the good. The other thing is that in terms of, of us using the online scanned version, one of the things that, that is nice about that is that you can blow up the image on your screen, which helps in terms of deciphering some of what, what's there. I see Kristen on the screen, uh, almost going to guess. I'll mention one more thing, Kristen, if that's all right. Um, a alternate version of of Plymouth Plantation is going to be available online, published online. It's the verbatim transcription of the text that provides notes, uh, textual notes to all of the emendations that were made over time. So it's much more heavily annotated for those who might have seen that. That's going to be available soon at the Colonial Society for Massachusetts, at NEHGS site, and at the State Library of Massachusetts site. So be on the lookout for that. Right. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. That was fascinating, particularly your, your comments about the libraries. Um, I would like to say that we didn't get to have a chance to get to all of the questions. So Dr. Bremer, Dr. Minkamo, is there an email address where people could reach? Yes, they, they can reach me at Francis, F-R-A-N-C-I-S dot Bremer, B-R-E-M-E-R at Millersville, M I L L E R S V I L L E dot E D U. And I welcome uh, questions at Ken dot Minkama, M I N K E M A, funny Dutch name, at Yale dot E D U. Thank you very much. Well, this has certainly been a fascinating conversation. I appreciate your time. And thank you to all of you who've, who've been here with us for the past hour. On behalf of NEHGS and the Boston Public Library, um, thank you for joining us and please stay well. Take care. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much.